So I'm very pleased to have uh, three distinguished speakers um, coming from uh, distinguished universities in these uh, three countries. And uh, somehow, um, I think some of the presenters mentioned that the data has a huge potential for tackling societal challenges, including environment, sustainability, energy, but then that there are many uh, challenges. Um, so especially uh, we'd like to see what are the key challenges and opportunities in emerging economies. Um, somehow uh, in, in Asia, we have uh, many countries and regions which are somehow trying to promote more economic growth, but at the same time, uh, tackle societal challenges. So first, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Wang Xin Li. Um, she's a associate professor in the School of Energy and Environment in the City University of Hong Kong. And also she's a visiting associate professor in Qinghua University in China. So the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I prepared a few slides for, okay, good. Um, today, I guess I only have about 10 minutes, so I'll be very quick just to walk you through some of the very basics regarding the ESG information disclosure in China. And that is the task assigned by Masaru. All right, um, in the next few minutes, uh, Sorry, did yeah, I yeah, ask her to change the Did I push the, this this the button? Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, I should Sorry. push this one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, good. It's working. Um, I guess. I can just quickly refer back to the key messages, especially the key challenges highlighted by the Secretary General of the United Nations at the COP27. And basically he expressed the concerns about the data quality issues, especially related to net zero commitments. Hmm? All right. And just, to quote exactly what he said, the problem is that the criteria and benchmarks for the net zero commitments have varying levels of rigor and loopholes, wide enough to drive a diesel truck through. And this, I guess, can be also relevant for what I'm going to be talking about, uh, the, current situations in, in China as well, probably a lot of other places also. And then he expressed the very high level commitment. We must have zero tolerance for net zero greenwashing. And that actually has been going on quite a lot in the ESG communities and in the financial institutions. And furthermore, he pointed out the four key areas of work. Why is environmental integrity that has to do with whether we should be holding up to the 1.5 degrees Celsius in the global warming and then credibility of the basically carbon accounting systems and accountability of all those different organizations involved in this business. And the last one is the role of the governments. And what I will be um, focusing on will be to look at what the government has done in, in China, because as you all may know, a lot of changes in China has have been mainly um, driven, no matter if it's through the pool or by pushing, then the government has been playing a very important role in the transition towards uh, low carbon development and uh, greener development, etc. So at the global level, the one of the major achievements is the global stock take. And uh, China has been trying to do that, especially uh, that is under the umbrella of green GDP. And then the second one is a breakthrough agreement 
to provide loss and damage funding for vulnerable countries that hit hard by climate disasters. Even though I wouldn't necessarily call it achievement, it has made financial resources available for the most vulnerable countries, but in terms of what the resources will be needed for the net zero transition, actually not only damages will be recovered, but also pre preventive measures will have to be taken that has to do with uh, innovations, techno technological adoptions, this diffusion, et cetera. So if we only look at loss and damages, then I guess that is not the complete picture. And then in terms of the ESG, it is not just to look at the loss and damages, but to look into the future opportunities as well. And in terms of the enabling policies regarding the ESG practices, I have tried to put together the packages of financial policies that have been mainly pushing the financial sector to pay attention to the environmental, social, and governance performances of the, uh, basically of their, loans projects and also investment projects. It was started in 2002 and then gradually moving from the China, People's Bank of China to the China Securities Regulatory Commission. And then now all the regulatory commissions in China, including securities and also uh, insurance, et cetera, they all have been engaged with this business. And the most recent one, uh, okay, let me sit back a little bit. The original push was from the Ministry of Environmental Protection. It has initiated the move to work together with those um, banking regulator, uh, reg regulators to impose policies and requirements on the listed companies before they can go public. And that requirements has basically set the entry barriers for a lot of probably very profitable companies, but then they actually extract their uh, profits and revenues at the cost of the environment, such as uh, the Zijin uh, Gold Mine in, uh, Corporation. And then afterwards, not only just to uh, make the entry barriers, but also they check back regularly on the performance of the companies that have already been listed on the uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen stock exchanges, and then to check their performances and then to publish their performance to the public through the mass media or on the websites of the uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection, and also link their performances with the um, you, you know, in China, a lot of um, development projects have to be linked with the quota uh, controlled by the central government related to like the land acquisition or uh, the quota to use the electricity and also the total amount of pollution can be discharged uh, from the companies. So those performances are linked with the assignment or allocation of those quota to the local governments at the provincial level. So in that sense, that will give pressure to the provincial governors and also the environmental protection bureaus at the provincial level to check the corporate environmental and social performances. So in that way, there is a kind of closed loop. And then the most recent one, is not just to give pressure through the government hierarchies, but also to give pressure directly on the list of the companies. Um, that is uh, the policy rolled out by the state-owned asset supervision and uh, regulatory commission. It required all the listed companies under the control of the central enterprises to voluntarily publish their ESG performance data starting in 2023, so about a month 
away. And that would be the first move in China, putting direct requirements on the listed companies to publish or compose uh, to publish their ESG data. So that is a very good move. I'm not sure how long it's going to take to uh, let the Shenzhen stock exchange and the Shanghai stock exchange to, to pick up that as well. And I guess in the interest of time, I will just stop here. I just wanted to show you this, um, those two diagrams. If we look at the uh, ESG performance of the corporations, uh, one of the most important um, aspects that we would like to look into is their discharge of pollutants and also the consumption of energy and electricity, and then the use and transfer of hazardous uh, materials or toxic materials. And those actually have been covered by the law on clean production. For all the companies that have ever exceeded the national standards on those three criteria, or they have exceeded the total amount, the, the quota assigned to that specific sector in the locality, then those companies have to publish their um, relevant information. And the most recent check done by the Qingyue Environmental uh, Data Services Institute, they found actually the level of compliance is very low. So as you can see from the um, histograms here, and uh, out of the 32 uh, provinces and the regions that they have examined, because the Xinjiang um, farming group is also included. So there are altogether 33. And then the percentage of the regions in compliance with that law actually is very low. Okay. So in terms of information quality, the, the amount of information and the quality of information um, publicly available on the ESG performance of the corporations, um, I think we still have a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I think increasingly ESG has been um, emphasized by uh, many governments also so in the financial sector, but then that the quality and the quantity of data is actually fundamental to ensure that they are doing uh, good for, uh, for the environment. But um, I think there are many challenges in, in this area still. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then I'd like to invite the next speaker, Professor um, Bigness Wara uh, Iravara San. Sorry, my pronunciation is uh, completely wrong, I guess. Um, he is a professor at the School of Management in the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, India. And the uh, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. I uh, hope you are able to hear me and uh, you are able to see my screen. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't attend it in uh, person. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, in uh, next five or seven minutes, what do I do? Uh, I will talk, focus about uh, India. I will uh, basically talk about uh, four major things. I will look at uh, the potential of uh, data-led innovation, what is going to happen, what is its present status, what are the challenges, and what can be done. This is what I'm going to cover it in, uh, say, next six or uh, seven minutes or so. So when we talk about potential, uh, Indian government runs this uh, Indian Railways, largest employer, almost one of the largest employers of the world. It opened up a little bit of data related to catering and ticketing. And a lot more uh, startups uh, started uh, doing business around this particular data, which almost composes of 34% uh, of its revenue. So if you extrapolate it, uh, there is a possibility that uh, the startups in this particular country can uh, leverage this open digital ecosystem. It can lead up to uh, 148 billion US dollars. Some calculations we made, and uh, it is likely to contribute uh, five percentage of GDP in this country. So when we uh, look at this particular data, there is a lot more uh, potential for uh, data that can bring in. But unfortunately, that is not really happening. Very few companies are working on this. Uh, say, for example, a company like India Stat 
started in 2010. Uh, it is doing a lot more work, making use of this open data and giving it for us a premium service. And in the Indian market, there is a lot more uh, dark market is available for uh, uh, your personal data, especially for the sales and marketing agencies end up buying your data and using it. So there is a lot more potential in terms of revenue generation, innovation, employment generation, but it is not really happening. Right? What is the present status? Okay, I would say uh, data development or uh, data led innovation or evidence making or innovation, I would say that it's a work in progress in this country. The country uh, started looking at it in 2012 uh, in terms of national data sharing and accessibility policy. The thinking is there, it is in the right direction. So we started a open government data platform. Uh, uh, it, it has uh, data for 165 government agencies in 33 sectors. India is a large country. It is having more than 29 uh, different subnationals or states or provinces, we call it. So there are a lot more data flowing in. And the national uh, think tank run by the government is also looking at that national data and analytics platform where it ends up providing a lot of insights for people. But if you look at the, uh, what, if you look at the use, who are the people who are using this particular data? We do not have adequate insights on whether the government is really using it or not. But there's a lot more use by academic economists. We have a lot of research papers coming out, making use of the data that is produced by the government. And we also have a, a, a occasional sensational media reports uh, end up saying that uh, the rural population is spending more time on mobile talk time compared to cosmetics. Okay, those kind of uh, sensational stories come up once in a while. Otherwise, I do not see uh, much usage of this open data by either by various government agencies or by the private players in order to generate revenues. This is the status in nutshell. Uh, in terms of challenges, there is a problem. Why the usage is very low? One is uh, the quality asymmetry in terms of uh, uh, data provision. There are a lot more missing data sets. It's outdated. If you look at uh, data.gov.in, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, data sets that are coming in, say, three years old or four years old. It is not really useful for people who are looking at uh, some business models using the recent data. And uh, there are a lot more data provision is dependent on subnational governments. Some of them are, are, are belong to the opposition party of the central government. There is always a subnational government and the central government power dynamics is going on. So a lot of times so the sharing of the data gets also gets problematic. At the central level, uh, the policy advisory are in terms of regulatory environment, it provides uh, a lot more mixed signals. Uh, after long, long deliberations, uh, we came up with uh, data anonymization protection guidelines uh, in August 22, but it is again uh, withdrawn uh, because there are a lot more criticism related to it. The government has withdrawn it and reworking on it. For five years, we discussed about uh, digital personal data protection bill, and uh, so recently a new one uh, got introduced in November. Right. So if you look at it, uh, something gets introduced, there is a lot of feedback, criticism, and we go back on it, and the new thing gets introduced. So there is no clear signal related to this, how what we are going to do with the data, whether the monetization is going to happen, or how we can use it for evidence making, it is not very clear. There is also a problem with uh, uh, when we open up the data. Uh, the way you are using it needs to be aligned with a good governance image. You cannot say anything very critical about the government. When you start doing it, uh, the sharing of the data gets problematic. For instance, uh, we have a lot more information related to electronic transactions. This is a good story to say that uh, the country is moving in the right direction. Whereas the data related to farmer suicide or unemployment gets tricky. Either the government delays it, or the way it is being written in various media, newspaper articles, or, or, or a trade press articles, it gets problematic. So the government is slightly skeptical about the usage of the data. So when the, the data gets opened up, it is being used for business purposes, well and good, but unfortunately it ends up using it for criticism of the government, which government is not really happy about it. Very small scale studies show that uh, the behavioral intention to use is also very low among, amongst the academics and various other people. When, we are, when the study asked okay, whether you are likely to use the open government data, the usage is relatively low. Uh, overall complementary assets uh, in terms of uh, demonstration effect, uh, the decision sciences, we call that uh, data analytics, we call it as decision sciences in the private sector is also still low. The adoption is very low. So you do not see great uh, uh, demonstration in the private sector. Okay? The possibilities of spillover from the private sector to the government sector is not exactly happening. 
because the adoption is very low in the private sector. These are the various challenges. So what I did, uh, what I what I just shared is I looked at uh, the the potential, what can create, and what is the status, and what are the challenges. Now, what are the possible things one can do? All right, uh, one is uh, awareness about uh, the data or the evidence-based policy making. Uh, basically, the policymakers need to understand uh, clearly, saying that the data is going to be very useful for them in terms of their work. There is a need for uh, capacity building. The existing machinery is not well equipped to handle this data analytics. People run away from mathematics and uh, it involves a lot of mathematics. You need a lot of intermediaries to interpret the data and uh, give it in a form where people can consume. There is a problem. We need a clear regulatory environment and advisory positions. Clearly, the government takes a stand saying that we are here for this and we would like to implement this. That is not coming out very clearly. Uh, since we have a very complex arrangement of various states and provinces uh, coming together, there is a state government, there is a central government, there is a different kinds of uh, agencies working together. Uh, these agencies need to talk to each other. There is a need for a proper uh, national data management and government structure. This is needed. Uh, there is also a need for uh, incentive for the data sharing. Uh, as a government agency, when I share the data, what is that I'm going to get? Okay, what is the first order effect? I understand that it is good for national building. Uh, it is good for creating innovations and everything. But as a government agency, what do I get out of it? Okay, the first order effects are not very clear. There is no incentive attached to it. So there is a need for it. Personally, I feel that uh, the, uh, the, the startup should be encouraged. You open up the data and clearly say that, okay, this data can be useful for uh, thinking of new businesses. And in India, very uh, we end up seeing uh, frequent cases, whereas the new companies, new age companies are trying to fill these gaps created by this, the government agencies in terms of service delivery, right? You have a lot more private companies are uh, filling up uh, infrastructure and inadequacies for a profit model. I would call that as a digital social enterprises. So there is a possibility that we can encourage them. Once you start encouraging it, what happens? The data is available and this particular uh, startup should be able to make use of it and fill a lot more needs. It ends up uh, delivering the developmental goals. So these are the possible things we can do. So with this, I'll stop. Uh, I'll be happy to take the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fignes. Um, this is uh, such an excellent um, uh, talk about the all the challenges uh, you face in using data for uh, innovation and also some of the challenges like data sharing and also um, the, uh, the, the uh, regulatory framework to encourage all these uh, incentives. So thank you very much. And then I'd like to invite uh, Professor Shawin Omar um, he's a associate professor uh, in the, the La Salle University in the Philippines, and he's also heavily involved in uh, data governance and data policy in the Philippines. He can join the ship. Oh, he cannot. Oh, okay. Um, okay, <laughs> it's it's very uh, unfortunate that uh, he will not be able to join. Um, <clears throat> So um, perhaps um, I'd like to move on to um, ask uh, questions, um, particularly now we have um, speakers from China and India, the largest economies in the world. And because of the, the sheer size of the economies and there should be many um, challenges um, in encouraging the use of data. Uh, I, I actually have a question to um, the Wang Xi. Um, well, I think that ESC um, is such a big topic, and then data is, is one of the key components for facilitating ESC. And now, increasingly, particularly the, after this the, the climate change uh, discussion, then not, now we are talking about the scope-free uh, uh, data. So not only your own company, but also you need to trace the whole emissions uh, through the supply chain. So how China is going to address this challenge? Because it's really about the data sharing among companies and also the governments, but this really requires um, some solid uh, the institutional environment to encourage all the stakeholders to share the data and to use the data. So how uh, China is, is going to address this uh, huge challenge? Um, in terms of um, tracking the um, transactions 
Um, as you may know, the value added uh, tax in China actually that could um, potentially facilitate that exercise because that value added tax itself is to track the additional uh, production processes occurred in the basically in the supply chain. So through that, it may be possible to also trace what kind of resources and uh, amount of energy, et cetera, have been carried out within the supply chain. But then if we also look nowadays at the um, corporations that have already shifted their operations somewhere else, not within the um, board country borders, then I'm not sure how, how that could be done. And also if we trace the scope three, which may not necessarily be a very bad uh, thing for, for China itself, because if we look at the consumption occur in the US or in, in Europe, then they may have to also share the burden of that imported carbon emissions somewhere outside their geographical boundaries. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then I also have a question to uh, Vignesh uh, about the situation in India. Um, for example, in India, I think uh, you have a very um, uh, kind of, I would say, ambitious um, uh, uh, the approach to uh, data, for example, Adaha system, that they really are trying to collect all the, uh, the personal information and then try to use it uh, for many applications. At the same time, as I mentioned, that now it seems to be uh, the, the some of the policy proposals have been withdrawn because of the, all the, I guess, the oppositions and criticisms to these uh, sort of uh, ambitious approach. So how do you see um, the, the future of uh, the Indian uh, the government to try to address this the, uh, the collection and use of data. Uh, somehow you have a very ambitious uh, the, uh, the ideas, but at the same time you have also need to deal with all the political oppositions and, and criticisms. So how do you see the future uh, with regard to this uh, the policies in this area? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Masaru. Uh, I would uh, take this question uh, looking at historically what India is doing related to reforms or policy interventions. Uh, people call that as, as a, a, a reforms by stealth, right? Uh, so you tell people that you are going to move five steps and there's a lot of criticism. You step back at two steps, but still you have moved three steps. So what do you do is uh, you introduce a, a bill, uh, you introduce a draft of the policy guidelines and there's a lot of criticism. You dilute it a little bit, but still you are moving in the same direction. Overall, the government is uh, positive about uh, uh, using, uh, using the data for developmental purposes. They are exploring ways by which we can monetize it. They are looking at ways by which we can improve the governance. So if it gets reflected by the statements made by the prime minister, uh, if you look at the amount of investment being made in various, uh, uh, various initiatives, all these things show us that is going in the right direction. But then we are a democratic country and uh, uh, every five years we have elections. Okay, we cannot completely ignore the opposition party. So we need to make a little bit of adjustments. Those adjustments uh, sometimes end up derailing this entire uh, activity. But in this case, I do not see the derailing happening. But if, if you look at it, we started in uh, 2012. So we are talking about only a 10 years, the data. So when you look at the electronic governance uh, uh, discourse or electronic governance, uh, 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 electronic governance related research, we started uh, computerizing at the back end very late, right? So we started computerizing it, automating the process. Now we are moving into the next stage saying that, okay, there are a lot of data has been accumulated. What can we do about it? We are going in that particular direction. We are slow, we are a work in progress, we are going in the right direction, but the process is going to be slower. That will be my, my take. Uh, I don't think we are going to close everything uh, completely down and uh, a strict censorship, that kind of situation will not arise, but we are going slow. Uh, that will be my take. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, and then I'd like to ask the audience to um, ask any uh, questions. Uh, 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, um, currently we're talking about, you know, technology and the policy, right? So the, the de facto, the fact is that technology far among, amongst beyond policy. So when we come to on um, so-called making policy, the, the technology is already gone, right? So, so in what way are we talking about you know, <laughs> technology and policy and AI and how, how we try to control in so-called narratives? like what, what, we're, what, what we're doing right now, talking about having a, 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 a conversation, having this when the technologies already go way beyond what we could even talk about. I, I, I just want to have a conversation. So I'm, I could keep asking questions. Yeah, so on... Um, this is what this conference is about, right? Yeah. Um, so probably this can be uh, addressed in the context of what is called the pacing problem in the sense that technological change is so fast, but then that the regulators and decision makers may not be able to catch up with the speed of technological change. And also policies cannot be changed so quickly. So how um, and this kind of asymmetry of, of change between the the, the yeah. technological if, speed if and I then may... to policy making. So um, I, I'd like if to ask I may, the... if, if I may interrupt. So this is, a, I'm not the first one to, who is saying, saying this, you know, technology are not um, being built, uh, built in, in government, right? So the governments are only following up, you know, and then making policies. But the thing is that the technologist okay. and who actually knows what's going on, it's not in the government. Yeah, okay, so thank what, you. What, what yeah, kind just... of a policy can we possibly make? Yeah. So because of the time constraint, I'd like to ask the speakers to, to, to answer to your question. So one thing or Ignish. Okay, I'll just take a first cut. I'm out. I may not be able to answer fully address your question. It is a very big question, actually. I think a lot of people are worried about the data privacy and also the basically not not tyranny sometimes already, right? The tech companies would uh, misuse and abuse their high or very advanced um, level of knowledge um, information and then to manipulate and to their advantages. So that, that has been going on, but then to what extent the government can probably make good use of those machineries and uh, technology for the common good. Um, I think there is a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities as well. So for example, um, in the social media, people are free to express their opinions and then that those opinions, if they are actually typed into the policy making processes, it will help the government and also probably even corporate decision makers to understand the people's preferences. That is already going on in the commercial uh, world. They will do targeted um, advertisement already, but then for the government, if they really want to make good use of the limited resources and also to meet the needs that would be 
probably personalized needs of their constituencies. Then that information revealed through the social media platforms could be a very good uh, source to draw upon. And also, if we talk about other issues, like if we want to trace the um, ESG performance in terms of verification and the auditing, especially related to social aspects, um, then the advanced information technologies could also be useful. Um, I think technology itself doesn't have um, doesn't have to take a side, either positive or negative, just like the atomic bombs, right? Not the technology itself can become, um, can be used in the way that would help people, but at the same time, it could also be used to damage people. So I, I hope in terms of literacy, um, probably not only the government, but also uh, scholars, just like myself, or I cannot speak of others, of course. But then I think um, for me, I really want to catch up with the new development in the technologies and to understand more how I can better engage with the discussions and the debates related to data and policy. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Vignesh to uh, respond. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful uh, question. I would say this question is not really uh, uh, new. Uh, this is around 2000 years old. So uh, when you construct a uh, road, people are being asked who's going to benefit, right? Is there an urban bias? Okay, are you introduced colleges? Say that why not more schools? Why are you talking about college? Right, this conversation is always needed, uh, right? In terms of why do we really need to do in this or this is really needed? This conversation is really needed. For that matter, the kind of conferences, what we are having, what we are having this conversation is important for us to understand, it, number one. Number two, uh, policy is going to be always, always delayed uh, in terms of uh, technological change, okay? How are you responding to it? The response is going to come in uh, two ways. One is uh, whether it's going to be harmful to people, right? I allow this particular technology to flourish, whether it's going to harm the people. So as a state, it is my responsibility to take care of people. So I will do something about it. That's number one. So to, in order to do this, I need to see the consequences. I need to see the impact, all right? People were smoking in public places over a period of time. These are the consequences. You stop smoking, okay? You say that, no, you cannot smoke in public places. The second one is when you need investment, all right? Say, for example, you need to spend this taxpayer's money in building this infrastructure. So you cannot build an infrastructure which cannot be used more than say, for example, uh, if it is cannot be used more than five years, it's waste of money, we cannot do this. So we need to wait and see, estimate whether it is gonna be really useful. Okay, for a longer time, whether it's a return on investment is for the taxpayers money, we end up doing it. So in order to look at that impact, in order to understand what is a potential impact is gonna create in terms of infrastructure, we need time. So there is gonna be always a lag. Okay, since there is a lag, should we stop having the conversation? I don't think so. We should continue having this conversation. At least when you are taking decisions, the decisions are informed decisions. That will be my two cents. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is uh, such a big topic uh, to discuss, but then the time is uh, now up. So um, thank you uh, very much, Professor uh, Lee, and also Vignesh um, for their excellent talks. And thank you very much. Thank you.